U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to China was initially hoped to ease tensions between the U.S. and China, but it seems that it did not meet expectations. Her visit was criticized by both sides. Although Chinese state media described the visit as pragmatic and rational, this faint flame was swaying in the wind, as if it could be extinguished at any moment. Yellen's actions seemed more like dancing in the wind, trying to protect this fragile flame. Firstly, Yellen's awkward handshake in China received criticism from many American netizens. Yellen's frequent bowing resembled the actions of ancient courtiers paying respects to an emperor, which displeased many Americans. After watching the video, I couldn't help but laugh. Yellen really has a great sense of humor. As she approached He Lifeung, she tightly grasped his hands and, being relatively petite, she nodded frequently while exchanging greetings, bowing at least three times. But what about He Lifeung? He only extended a single hand and even took a slight step back, seemingly intentionally giving Yellen more head bowing space. He was quite graceful, wasn't he? Knowing that Yellen accepts such gestures, how can he not leave enough space for her? An expert tweeted, I hope someone tells American officials to stand straight when shaking hands with Chinese officials. That statement makes sense. Comparing it with the photo of Antony Blinken shaking hands with Xi Jinping, Blinken was clearly standing straight, indicating his firm stance to the world. Former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani also tweeted, commenting without reservation, Yellen will undergo two weeks of back rehabilitation treatment. Bowing repeatedly to the Chinese Communist Party has strained her back muscles. It seems Yellen needs to strengthen her fitness training, especially focusing on exercises for her back muscles, so that she won't strain them from frequent bowing. We should also not forget some history. It is said that former U.S. President Barack Obama bowed nearly 90 degrees to the Japanese emperor during his visit to Japan in 2009. At the time, Obama explained that it was a gesture of respect with no ulterior motive. Perhaps we can give Yellen some room for explanation as well, considering that diplomatic etiquette can be quite complex at times. But this makes me wonder, if someone is too respectful and friendly in a diplomatic setting, does it equate to being subservient to dictators? It's truly puzzling. Yellen's lunch with a group of Chinese female economists in Beijing also became a hot topic among Chinese netizens. This group of female economists, accused of being radical feminists and traitors, has become public enemies in the Chinese online sphere. One of the female economists responded online to the question of why she attended the lunch, stating that Yellen is the friendliest U.S. official and has always been committed to developing friendly relations between China and the U.S. This female economist's response was quite straightforward, showing no fear of being criticized. Chinese netizens commented that Yellen is an obviously dangerous person, and questioned why she was allowed to be a public guest in China. Some even said that these female economists are pro-American, treating them like thorns in their eyes. A Chinese netizen named Sean 3847 said, Look at these people, China's newly enacted anti-spying law might come into play soon. That comment was quite harsh. Others said that everyone around the table should be arrested, as none of them are good people. The U.S. always kindly offers help, but it ends up being misunderstood as exposing traitors. In fact, this also reflects that we live in a highly critical and interconnected society. The actions of every public figure can become topics of discussion for others, and they can be magnified infinitely. Regardless, Yellen concluded her visit to China and stated in a press conference that despite deep differences between the two countries, both sides will seek more frequent communication. She emphasized the importance of trade and investment, stating that both the U.S. and China can benefit from as open a trade and investment environment as possible. Trying to decouple from China would be disastrous. This story teaches us a lesson. While the posture and expressions in diplomatic settings are indeed important, sometimes we need to weigh the pros and cons. However, ultimately, we should focus more on the true intentions and goals behind the actions, rather than just the formality. I believe that in Yellen's future diplomatic activities, she will definitely maintain an upright posture during handshakes. After all, she won't forget about this handshake experience. Who says Asia can't be more tolerant? Look at the Asian Olympic Council, they held a conference, and suddenly, Russia and Belarus became part of our Asia. Not only that, they even gave them a maximum of 500 athlete quotas for the next Asian Games. Oh, yes, you heard it right. This is Asia's inclusiveness, we can even redraw maps, and the whole world should learn from us. The Secretary General of the Council emphasized that Russian and Belarusian athletes should be allowed to participate but only as individuals, under a neutral flag, with no chance of winning any medals. They are so generous, it's like telling someone they can attend a party but not have fun. Or inviting them for dinner but only offering plain tofu.
Truly, this is an Olympic level slap in the face. I can only imagine the excitement athletes felt upon hearing this news. Congratulations, you have been selected to participate in the Asian Games. Just remember, you won't represent your country, you won't have a chance to win any medals, and by the way, you might just need to wear a blank t-shirt. Enjoy, it's like a participation trophy, a symbol of achievement without any actual accomplishments. But of course, we shouldn't forget the noble reasons behind all of this. Last year, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to their athletes being banned from various international competitions. Now, the International Olympic Committee seems to want to give them a second chance. Just please don't invade any other countries while you're here, they must be saying. It's like telling a child who has a history of destructive behavior, sure, you can come to the birthday party, but if you break anything, there won't be any cake for you. So, as we prepare for the next Asian Games, let's remember the spirit of competition, unity, and absurdity. Let's witness athletes competing not for national glory or personal achievements but for, well, I'm not sure what they're competing for either. Perhaps they'll vie for the titles of most neutral athlete, or least likely to win a medal. Who knows? So, get ready for an exciting version of the Asian Games, where athletes will compete without flags, without national pride, and without the opportunity to win. Truly, this will be a neutral display of the sporting spirit. Let's talk about Jack Ma and his once dominating Alibaba that had the world in his hands. We all know Jack Ma, the man with dark hair and outspoken opinions. His entrepreneurial story is inspiring, but his recent two years have been a completely different story. He once said, if you want to be successful, find an industry that will criticize you, beat you, even kill you, but never let go. It seems like Beijing heard this statement and chose to beat him. We all know that two years ago, Jack Ma criticized Beijing, and as if Beijing heard a particularly unfunny joke, they started suppressing his company. The consequences of this joke were huge, as his company's market value evaporated by a staggering $850 billion. It seems that when you have $61 billion in your bank account, anchoring Beijing comes at a cost. Do you know how much Alibaba's largest depreciation was? It was 45%, which amounts to $620 billion. Just imagine, $620 billion disappearing just like that, as if you went to the supermarket one day, ready to buy a bag of chips, and when you went to pay, you found your wallet empty. But this time, it's not the money for chips that Jack Ma's wallet is missing, it's a whopping $620 billion. And have you heard of Ant Group? It's the financial technology giant co-founded by Jack Ma. Do you know how much its valuation dropped? It was 75%, which is $236.5 billion. If I had that much money, I might consider buying a planet. Because of all this, Jack Ma was forced to disappear for over two years. It reminds me of a joke. Do you know how a magician disappears? They put themselves into one hat and come out from another. But Jack Ma used folding space magic, he put himself into China, then appeared in Thailand, and then in Hong Kong. The next second, he was back in his hometown of Hangzhou. I really wish he could teach me this folding space magic so that I wouldn't have to waste so much time commuting every day. Jack Ma is truly a busy person. Even during his disappearance, he didn't sit idle. He went to watch a Muay Thai match in Thailand, visited Hong Kong, and then returned to his hometown of Hangzhou. He was even appointed as an honorary professor at the University of Hong Kong. That's what I call, disappearing. If I were to disappear, I would just stay at home, eat chips, and watch Netflix. But when Jack Ma disappears, he's probably thinking about his next entrepreneurial project, like, I don't know, Antspace, or, Alibaba time travel. We can only wait and see. Let's give Jack Ma a round of applause. I think we can all learn something from his experience, if you make a big mistake, disappear for two years, and then have your wealth halved. Then you can become, Jack Ma. US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, before leaving China on the 9th, said that the US and China still have differences on a range of issues, but she believes that this visit has strengthened efforts to put the bilateral relationship on a more solid track. Yellen also said that some progress has been made during this visit, and I think we can have a healthy economic relationship that benefits both sides and the world. She expressed that we believe the world is big enough for both of our countries to prosper, but she emphasized that both the US and China have a responsibility to manage their relationship responsibly. Yellen met with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, Vice Premier in charge of finance He Lifeng, Governor of the People's Bank of China Yi Gang, and Party Secretary of the People's Bank of China Pan Gongsheng. She also had a meeting with retired former Vice Premier Liu He and had dinner with several female economists. Yellen repeatedly tried to dispel China's concerns about the US seeking decoupling and even avoided mentioning the term during her visit. 
She used a new term starting with D in the context of supply chain issues, diversify. She said that there is a significant difference between decoupling and diversifying or taking targeted national security actions on critical supply chains. Some analysts believe that Yellen's high-profile reception during this visit highlights China's unwillingness to decouple from the U.S. Although diplomatic and economic exchanges have resumed between the two countries, China has not yet restarted the military exchanges expected by the U.S. Washington and Beijing have once again engaged in face-to-face -face dialogue, which, even if not enthusiastic, can be considered polite and respectful. The Biden administration seems to be trying to prove that its China policy is not simply a continuation of the Trump administration's open hostility towards Beijing. China accounts for about one-third of global semiconductor sales. However, for some chip manufacturers, China represents 60% or 70% of their revenue. Even chips produced in the US are often sent to China for assembly and testing. The dependence of the chip industry on China indicates that the closely intertwined and contradictory economic relationship between China and the US poses challenges for both sides. The US and China previously conducted joint operations to combat fentanyl, but now their cooperation is at a standstill due to widespread geopolitical tensions on trade, human rights, Russia, and Taiwan. The failure of cooperation on fentanyl interception symbolizes the stagnation of bilateral relations at various levels. The US is now demanding that China take more measures to curb the flow of chemicals used to manufacture fentanyl globally. On the 9th, Ron DeSantis, the second largest Republican candidate in the US presidential election, expressed his support for canceling China's most favored nation status. He said, I think we may need congressional cooperation, but I will take appropriate administrative measures to move in this direction. He also referred to China as the number one geopolitical threat to the US. In 2000, the US Congress voted to grant China most favored nation status, and if it is to be cancelled, it also requires congressional approval. Taiwanese media cited senior Taiwanese national security officials on the 9th, stating that China not only engages in military harassment and cognitive operations against Taiwan but also manipulates economic tools to intervene in Taiwan's 2024 presidential election. They have previously banned the import of certain agricultural and fishery products from Taiwan but lifted the ban as the election approaches. Officials pointed out that Beijing's actions are creating a dangerous atmosphere and creating a feeling of unreliable interests in Taiwan's relationships with international friends. Taiwan's official has stated that as Taiwan is about to hold the Han Kuang Exercise 39, China continues to spread false information through official media, claiming that Tsai Ing-wen plans to use the exercise as a rehearsal for escape or that it is a U.S. citizen evacuation drill, attempting to undermine the morale of Taiwan's military and civilians. Taiwanese national security officials point out that Beijing's false information campaign this year is particularly evident, with the intention of influencing next year's Taiwan presidential election. Pope Francis has appointed 21 cardinals, including Joseph Zen from Hong Kong. For decades, the Vatican and Chinese authorities have often had tense relations over the appointment of bishops. Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam stated on the eve of July 1 that the legislation of Article 23 of the Hong Kong Basic Law, which concerns national security, must be enacted this year or at the latest next year. Zunzi, a Hong Kong political cartoonist, has been involved in creative work for over 40 years. Due to the controversial nature of his work, which often touches on social and political issues in a bold style, his work has occasionally sparked controversy. In May of this year, after Hong Kong officials publicly criticized his work multiple times, Ming Pao announced the suspension of his column. Zunzi stated that Beijing's implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong has brought many red lines to local news and artistic creation, but he has stated that he will not stop creating or leave Hong Kong. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi visited South Korea to alleviate concerns about nuclear waste. He emphasized that the IAEA's report is not biased towards Japan and that Japan's request for the IAEA to inspect the nuclear waste treatment process can serve as a good precedent. Japan recently announced plans to release millions of tons of Fukushima nuclear wastewater, which has led to protests from neighboring countries. South Korea and China have both banned the import of Fukushima food and seafood. Tesla has reportedly started laying off some battery assembly workers at its Shanghai factory. The number of workers affected and the specific reasons behind the layoffs are currently unclear. Tesla's Shanghai Gigafactory is its largest and most productive factory, employing about 20,000 workers. Some reports suggest that the total number of employees in the battery production line is less than a thousand. The Dalai Lama stated that Beijing has shown interest in contacting him. Before his visit to India and Ladakh, the Dalai Lama told the media that Beijing has expressed its willingness to contact him through formal or informal means.
The Dalai Lama also made it clear that he has no problem with resuming dialogue and that he is not seeking Tibetan independence. Beijing does not recognize the Tibetan government in exile, and since 2010, there have been no public negotiations between Beijing and the Dalai Lama's representatives. A knife attack occurred at a kindergarten in Hangshan Town, Linjiang City, Guangdong Province, China on Monday, July 10, resulting in six deaths, including three children. The police have arrested a 25-year-old man surnamed Wu and are investigating the motive behind the attack. Chinese authorities often attribute such attacks to individuals with grievances or a desire for revenge against society. Experts and some officials have previously stated that these attackers were dissatisfied with the rapid changes in Chinese society and social pressures such as unemployment. However, China still lacks sufficient mental health medical resources, and the social safety net is also weak. The government also tightly controls the dissemination of information related to such attacks and other tragic events. According to statistics, China's overall debt has reached 282% of annual economic output. Hello everyone, I am your news anchor, Yali, and we provide you with a one-stop service for daily news related to China. Feel free to leave your comments in the comment section, and we will carefully read and respond to your comments. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode, take care, everyone.